Yeah, so we have um, done a great job up till now to vaccinate people. We've had um, uh, initially with the vaccine rollout, of course, there was a great demand for vaccine because people wanted to get through the pandemic. They wanted to get immune um, without being infected. Um, and so vaccine induced immunity is the safest way to get us through this pandemic. So when the vaccine first came out in December, um, there was a, a huge demand. And of course we had those tiers, the priority groups, it was a little bit complicated for people. Um, but as we've been able to get um, a bigger vaccine supply in the US as a whole and California also, um, we've been able to, California um, Department of Public Health has been able to open up vaccination to wider and wider range of people um, so that now it's open to everybody 16 years of age um, and up. So it's really fantastic that the supply has, has really caught up with the demand. So we're really pleased with that. Now these vaccines were developed really with unprecedented rapidity um, and they are using novel technologies. So it is understandable that some people would be hesitant to use these vaccines. Um, but I would hope that with additional experience, and since we've had so many people vaccinated in the US with these vaccines, um, then we haven't seen any kind of unusual safety signals um, with the vaccines that I would hope that we would have um, uh, people would get more comfortable receiving the vaccines, even though they are new. They've been studied, you know, the, the studies prior to the emergency use authorization by the FDA, I mean, they were, uh, these vaccines were, were studied in thousands of people um uh, very closely and so we have robust safety data and robust safety systems in place awesome and so going back to that herd immunity i know i heard you mention it and i know that's kind of the one thing that we're all talking about we all want to know what what is that magic number what what number or what percentage is there a percentage that our community needs to get to in order to reach that herd immunity yeah, so we don't have precise numbers and it may be a moving target, but what we're thinking is probably somewhere between 70 and 85% of the population needs to be immune in order to have that herd immunity, meaning that we have very limited transmission when a case is introduced into a community. So this level of immunity throughout a community would allow public health authorities then to consider dropping the masking mandates or any of the limiting of social gatherings of crowded events. We go back to um, your, our usual way of life, going to houses of worship, going to sporting events, um, other entertainment events, and, and, and perhaps without masking. So that, that's, that's why we're looking at that number. Now we have to take that number with a grain of salt because there are some variables, including the new variants. And the new variants are more infectious, more transmissible than previous strains. And so that may result in us needing a higher rate of immunity within our communities in order to limit transmission. Okay, very interesting. I, I always thought maybe it was somewhere around that that 70% that 70 percent mark, but I personally wasn't totally sure where where we were at in that number. So anywhere between 70 to 85 percent, and we may not know for, for a little while if there is an exact number per se. Right. So the, the current strain that's um, most um, commonly transmitted in California are these California strains, and they're about 20% more infectious than previous strains. But the UK strain is um, more common in other parts of the country, including, for example, Michigan, where there's having, they're having very high rates of transmission right now. And that one, that one is about 50% more transmissible than previous strains. So, you know, that, that really just changes the, all the numbers when you, when you get these more transmissible strains that are out there. And then one of, one of the things that we're starting to see come up, I know, I know you mentioned demand was very, very, very high, as, as we all knew, everyone was struggling to get those vaccine appointments all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I totally understand that. And now what we're starting to see, specifically, I'm looking at one vaccination clinic in South Sacramento over at the over at the Pinnell Center. I was there last week and in the last hour, they approached me and they said, oh, we still have a couple hundred appointments available. Can you push this out to your viewers and let them know we're taking walk-ups? And then I just checked the, um, the scheduler online and they still have 
hundreds of vac vaccine appointments available for tomorrow's clinic. When a few weeks ago, those appointments were, you know, worth like, it felt like those were worth thousands of dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. And now it's like they have so many openings. So seeing that many openings, is that concerning to you? Yeah, I, I think what that shows is that in terms of vaccine distribution and the vaccine sites is there's still work to do with that. There's still work to do to reach the communities, to reach the people that need the vaccine. And we haven't had that much community outreach as, as, a, as, a, as a general public health measure. There hasn't been that much outreach to specific communities that we know are harder to reach. And so typically, for example, if we think of normal influenza seasons, We've got all sorts of public outreach into different communities, different languages and different cultures um, to try to reach people to get them vaccinated against influenza. And what I'm seeing is I'm just starting to see that now from the public health community, from the CDC, from CDPH um, and others. And so I think that's what's really needed. So we really need to make sure that, that um, the education is out there. Um, for these communities so that they do take advantage of available vaccine. And there, there was a study that recently came out. I'm pulling it up right now. There's a study that recently came out. Um, I'm trying to give you my source here uh, that said that it's possible that uh, in the United States, we could run out of people who want to take the vaccine in about a month. Um, any any thoughts on that study? Yeah, so we know that there's some people who are still vaccine hesitant um, and they don't want to be first in line to get the vaccine. I'm hoping that with additional experience um, that we have so many people in this country vaccinated, safely vaccinated, that they will be less hesitant. And even if they don't want to be first in line, maybe now with the additional experience, they'll, they'll, they'll be open to being vaccinated and actually wanna be vaccinated and wanna be immune. Um, you know, there are those then who are gonna be resistant to being vaccinated and their minds are made up. And I'm not sure what, what can be done about those people. It's really unfortunate. It's unfortunate for them personally that they may remain vulnerable to infection. And it's unfortunate for the rest of us also since this really um, is um, important for the whole community to be immune to limit transmission because these vaccines, no, no vaccine is 100% protective. So any, anybody who is susceptible to, uh, to infection, who's not immune, that puts them at danger of getting infected and everybody else in the community also. So, so, so I'm really hoping that that number is gonna be limited. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, from, from a doctor's perspective, how would you, what would you say personally to someone who is hesitant about this? Like I talk to, just personally speaking, I talk to my own mom about this daily. She is one of those people. She's not an anti-vaxxer, but she's very hesitant. She's like, I don't wanna be first. And I'm like, mom, millions of people have taken it. <laughs> It's effective, it's safe. I talk about it daily on the news, it's safe. So from your perspective, if you were to have that conversation with somebody like my 60 year old mother, what would you say to her to, to sort of convince her to get this vaccine? Well, yeah, everybody has individual concerns. So it's hard to give a blanket recommendation for, for how to approach it. I think everybody needs to be approached individually and make sure that if they've got concerns or questions that they have a trusted mainstream resource to answer those questions and to respond. So I would recommend for everybody, if they've got concerns about these vaccines, look up, look up at a standard mainstream site like the CDC or the FDA website. All the information on this, these vaccines has been publicly available. When these vaccines were pre presented to the FDA for emergency use authorization, you can look at all the data that the FDA considered on their website, and I did that. So for example, with each of the vaccines, when they were presented for, to, for the committee to approve those, there's about a 70 to 100 page document for each vaccine, which really nicely summarizes all the data, the preclinical data, the 
previous studies that were done, the, and then the, the large phase three um, studies that were done prior to approval, looks at all the safety data, all the immunity data, looks at all the data in terms of protection, it parses it out um, by different ages, by different underlying conditions, by different races and ethnicities. That's all publicly available. So look at that. And, and I think that if you look at that data, you'll be very reassured that these vaccines were very well studied. And if you've heard rumors, there's a lot of rumors out there. You know, not all those rumors are true. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. Um, there's a lot of unfounded allegations. A lot of them have a tiny amount of true scientific information associated with them that make them sound like they're valid. But go to a, a mainstream source and, and, and talk to them about it because um, the, the FDA, the CDC and others, they get these questions all the time. Um, and, and there are responses to these questions um, that, that I've heard of. Good. And the last thing I wanted to go over with you, um, what, what can you, this is a question coming from my producers, I'm not super familiar with this term, but what can you tell us about seroprevalence, if I'm saying that correctly, and how does that play into this? Yeah, so seroprevalence studies are studies that look to see um, how many people in the community have antibody, have an immune response um, to an infection. So with COVID, for example, you can sample um, a portion of the population and see what proportion um, has antibodies, which would be suggestive of previous infection. Now, not everybody who's infected forms antibodies, but the vast majority do. And you can differentiate um, antibody formation after infection compared to antibody formation after immunization. So you can get an idea of how many people in the community are then infected and presumably immune for some period of time. We're not exactly sure for how long people are immune for after they've been infected. Um, but you get an idea of, of, of that. So you get the proportion who are immune, presumably from infection. You figure out the proportion who are immune, presumably from immunization. And you add that up. And hopefully, eventually, that adds up to that threshold of 70, somewhere between 70 and 85 percent, that we have enough immunity within our communities to um, prevent transmission, to prevent widespread transmission. It's very difficult, though, to um, get really valid um, numbers for these seroprevalent studies. It, they, they come from different sources. Some of them come from commercial laboratories where people are having their blood drawn and sent for tests. Obviously, people who are having their blood drawn for tests don't represent the general population because they probably are sick or something. That's why they're having their blood drawn. So that might overestimate the amount of immunity in the community. Um, and then there are just um, other studies that look to um, ask for volunteers. And again, some people might volunteer because they think they've been infected. So that might also overestimate um, the, the seroprevalence, the amount of immunity within a community. So it's very difficult to interpret these, but it does give you some sense, some idea uh, of what proportion are infected. The CDC has probably the best data on this. And the last data that I've seen, which was from uh, a four week period ending in, in late February, shows that about 22% of Californians are immune. There's um, more recent um, data from the California Department of Public Health that, that suggests that up to 40% or more of Californians are, are immune. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not sure about how representative that is. So it's very difficult to understand um, how representative it is, but it's nice to follow over time. It gives some idea. Okay, good. Thank you for that. And I guess my last question for you, is there, is there a prediction or um, is there, I, I don't know if prediction is really the right word for it, but is there a timeline of when the medical community hopes we can reach that herd immunity? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure. You know, part of the issue is that some, we've, we've got a good portion of the population right now that's not eligible for vaccination and that would be children. And so even though this pandemic is primarily driven by adults and primarily affecting adults, if children are susceptible, that can still result in sustained community transmission. So we hope to get um, the, the FDA to get the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine 
down to 12 years of age in the next month or so. It's hard to predict when. So that'll be useful. And there are studies in even younger children also. Um, so once we can get more of the, the proportion of the population vaccinated and immune, um, we can reach that threshold. I'm not exactly sure when that's going to be, um, probably late summer, I would guess, um, but I'm, I'm just not sure, late summer, fall maybe. I think that would be the hope. <laughs> I would hope for late spring, early summer, but you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, there, is there anything else that you wanna add that you think we may have missed about uh, vaccine hesitancy? I would just say that you know if people have questions, I, I, I really recommend going to a mainstream resource and getting your questions asked, um, getting your questions asked and answered. Um, that's really the most important thing. And there's no one size fits all, and different people need different amounts of information to be comfortable getting immunized. You know, I, I know I did my research. I looked at all the the documents on the FDA website before I was vaccinated, and I would recommend that other people other people do the same. Um, people also may be aware of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine being on pause because of the blood clot issue. And I interpret that as showing how robust our vaccine safety systems are. This is a really rare event. You know, this blood clot issue is about one out of every million doses. And that's at least 10 times lower than the risk of getting blood clots if you get COVID. So still the benefits of vaccination outweigh those small risks. So I think a lot of these, these things that you hear need to also be put in perspective.